Um, our next session is a case study session. And we've um, chosen case studies um, that have all have a relationship to the University of Manchester and to uh, external cultural partners. Um, but also, I think you'll find um, a relationship to different social, cultural, and economic issues that, that may or may not be exacerbated or ameliorated through devolution, devolution in the Northern Powerhouse. So without further ado, over to our first case study presenter, Esme Ward. Thank you. Okay, so it did feel a bit like that this morning, actually. Um, this is a stereotype. It's grim up north. Um, and actually, what I want to talk to you about is a program that's called It's Not So Grim Up North, um, which uh, actually is looking at the relationship between health and culture. Um, I'm Esme Ward. I'm based at the Whitworth and Manchester Museum. And I also uh, lead the a arts and ageing work, um, both for Manchester and as part of the GM Ageing Hub. Um, Actually, what I want to think about, just for a minute, are the realities of uh, the health inequalities across Manchester. So Greater Manchester has incredibly high levels of ill health, particularly mental health, and the second lowest male life expectancy in the UK. And I could go on. Oh, it doesn't want to work. Okay. Um, at both the Whitworth and Manchester Museum, over nearly a decade now, we've been developing programmes, largely in partnership with the Central Manchester Foundation uh, University NHS Trust, um, which looks at bringing health and culture together. This is a real range of work um, that's about relationships between health practitioners and culture, as well as looking at telling a different story about ageing, one that's not necessarily about loss or deficit, but maybe more aspirational than that. So from dementia-based programmes, which is what you have images of here, a programme called Coffee, Cake and Culture, through to ward-based residencies, a stroke recovery arts programme, GP and practitioner training, this is what our work has focused on. And it comes from a place that wants to think about culture, and most particularly in this case museums, as places of care. So, of course, care for collections, but also for people, ideas, and relationships. We have a website, if it, which, if it wants to work, called Health and Culture. It's just died on me. Um, called Health and Culture, there we go. Um, which brings all of this work together. And every year we run a program called Culture Shots, where we essentially take over central Manchester hospitals and Trafford hospitals for a whole week, and we inject a shot of culture into the NHS. Um, over 4,000 NHS staff participated in this last year. It is fully funded by the NHS. Um, and I think most interestingly for me in this, um, it is funded out of their HR budget rather than out of any commissioning pot. Um, we've been running it for nearly four years now. And actually what we really wanted to do is we wanted to engage with those health practitioners. One of the things I'm probably most proud of, which on the face of it is quite a small thing, but I think significant, is that if you now come to train to be a GP in Manchester, the chances are you will meet one of my team, Wendy Gallagher, as part of your training to be a doctor. And I think it's a really good example of the humanising role of culture. And this autumn, we're launching something which is called the Cultural First Aid Kit, which is a partnership with CMFT. And it's for GPs and clinical practitioners, and it's to support their well-being. I just wanted to um, give a bit of a sense of the context for the programme Not So Grim Up North. So there is a momentum and there is a whole body of work here that enabled us um, back last year to put in some funding to the Arts Council for one of its research grants for a programme which we have called Not So Grim Up North. It's led by the Whitworth. Uh, it includes partners such as Manchester Museum, but also includes Tyne and Weir Museums in the Northeast who have some really wonderful similar work that they have been developing for a very long time around recovery and addiction programs. And both the Whitworth and Tyne and Weir Museums have been recognised for their work in this area by the Royal Society for Public Health. 
And we felt that there was a real opportunity here to work with some researchers at UCL, um, based within a, a, a well-being strand of UCL, to think about how we're really understanding and measuring the impact that this work is having. So what the Not So Grim Up North programme does is it tries to investigate the efficacy of museum encounters on a range of health and social care service users in Greater Manchester and in Tyne and Weir. It's a mixed methods approach. We're going to be collecting qualitative data as well as quantitative. And what we really want to do is we want to find out how museum activities can support recovery and rehabilitation for a whole range of distinct groups. Most notably, people living with dementia, stroke survivors, mental health service users, and those in relation to addiction. So our focus is very clearly on recovery and rehabilitation. The lead for the programme is Dr. Nuala Morse, who is based at the Whitworth, but also works widely uh, across Tyne and Weir as well. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail, and I wish Nuala were here to talk to you in more depth about mixed methods and mixed perspectives, but I just wanted to give a little bit of an idea about the different kinds of methodologies that we are exploring. First up, this is not about us trying to be clinical evaluators. That isn't what we're interested in. What we're interested in is, is actually being able to tell our own story to a wider range of people. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at methodologies that might be more fit for purpose. So we're taking a longitudinal approach to the research. We have repeated measures and follow-on interviews at three, six, and 12 months after the end of the museum programs. And we're just at the beginning of the process. So what we want to do over the next three years, and we've got Arts Council funding for this research program until the end of 2018, we want to identify the critical success factors and really build a case for the wider museum sector. With the devolution of health and social care budgets uh, and the development of particularly Manchester's local locality plan and more widely GM, Manchester is uniquely positioned to explore ways of linking existing cultural activity with health and, health and social care services. Um, anybody who knows anything about the development of one team and the potential to engage culture with their work will know that this is all starting to emerge now. And some distinct partnerships are already happening. Oh, God, sorry. Uh, some distinct partnerships are already happening. So as part of the devolution agreement, a memorandum of understanding was signed to set up something called a GM Aging Hub. Um, and the GM Aging Hub works across all of Greater Manchester with one aim, which is to think about how to become an effective age-friendly city region. Manchester was already an age-friendly city. In fact, it was the UK's first age-friendly city. And I'm the strategic lead for culture for age-friendly Manchester. That has now moved, and the shift in the focus is very clearly on Greater Manchester. As part of that application to be a GM ageing hub, culture was specifically identified as one of the most effective and actually innovative strands of work. So there's a strand around innovation, there's one around employability, there's one around housing, and there's one around transport, and there is also one around culture. We had our very first meeting last week of the GM ageing hub, so it's early days to see what might evolve. But what's apparent is that unlike other areas that have very developed infrastructures, with culture, we are going to have to find a way to do it differently. The infrastructure is not there in the same way. And our sense is that the evidence that will emerge, we hope, out of things like the Not So Grim Up North programme will help us tell a story that will be of interest to all of those who were sat around that table with me at the GM Aging Hub whether they are leads for transport or social care or clinical commissioning, and that we will be able to really show the difference that culture might make. Thanks. questions from the case studies just because of pressing time but feel free obviously to nab them later or contact them afterwards to hear more and, and get involved. Um, I'd like to introduce our next case study um, 
and this is from Simon Ruding, who is uh, nowhere to be seen. There he is, right in front. Please come round, Simon. You're being summoned up. Um, and Simon's going to talk about TIP, the theatre in prisons and probation. Have I got that the right way around? That many of you may have may know in the Greater Manchester area or worked with, and tell you more about how the work that TIP is involved with currently is uh, related to devolution. Over to you, Simon. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me to speak this afternoon. Um, I arrived with about 17 different drafts of scripts, um, and have written an 18th as I've been sat at the back, because I, I, I spent a period of time thinking, I think I might have been invited to the wrong conference, because there's been a lot of discussion about large uh, infrastructure type work, uh, prestige projects, tourism, um, bringing more money into the region. And, and, and I work with people at the opposite end of the spectrum. I work with people who are, on the whole, utterly and completely not engaged with any arts practice at all. Um, and we play, well, we hope to play a very, very particular role in the way, in, in engaging those people in arts practice and passing them on, moving them on to some of these larger organizations that I've represented and I've been discussed and talked about here. Um, so I guess I'm here speaking with a few different hats on, um, which is, a bit of a large responsibility for somebody who's had as little sleep as I've had over the last couple of days. I'm, I'm, I'm here as director of a small-scale arts organisation um, that is very proudly an NPO, even more proudly um, the only arts organisation to have Artsmark in recognition of the quality of the work that it does within youth justice. Um, I'm here as a representative of the participatory arts sector. Um, and. I'm specifically representing the branch of participatory arts that occupies its time working with people at the margins, um, by which I mean people outside the mainstream with, with communities that are all too easily ignored and have been systematically demonised by our current government and its predecessor. Um, <clears throat> So, um, I will, I'm, what I intend to do, just very, very quickly, is introduce you to a couple of our projects um, and, and, and to an idea and then come back and hopefully, if I've got time, to reflect on how that impacts in terms of the, the, the broader discussion. But first, a quiz. Hopefully if it work. Okay. So, um, everybody recognise the building on the left? Big tower? Big, big, what it is? People know what that is? Strange Ways, okay. What about the building in front of Strange Ways here, on the, on the, in the picture on the left? Okay, that was actually my secondary school, okay. So my secondary school abutted uh, HMP Manchester, and um, pe some people have heard me describe this before. My cross-country run was twice round the prison every Wednesday, okay. Now, if you know that part of Manchester, you know it's on a bloody great big hill, right? So I, I, I got very firm thighs when I was a teenager. Um, <laughs> now, I hated cross-country running, perhaps because it wasn't cross-country running, it was like inner city running, right? And I was used to inner city running. Um, but, but what I did was I fully participated. I was never engaged. I'm making a very clear distinction here. I took part because the school commanded it, right? But I never enjoyed it. I never wanted to go on and be a cross-country runner. I was not particularly engaged by the activity. So I've just taken us back a slide, hopefully. I just want to go back a slide, if someone could take me back a slide. Oh, there we go. That's what we do. We take people, hopefully, from participation to engagement. We're a small organisation with, it's only me who's full-time, the rest of our staff are part-time, but we punch a lot greater than our weight because we have a wonderful pool of highly talented and very well trained, that sounds like I've trained them, you know, with the, with the whip. No, I mean, they're trained very well. They're very good artists, working with us on a whole range of different projects. Everything from makeup artists to concrete sculptors to musicians, theater makers, writers and poets. What I'm hoping you're realizing here is that we're not just theater, okay? We are a mixed arts organization, hence the range of images that I've put up here. Our work, to pick up on a phrase that was used earlier on, our work occupies a very specific part of the arts ecology. 
as I say, and I want to keep repeating this, our job as a small-scale arts organisation, a specialist small-scale arts organisation, is to move people on. We meet people who are not engaged in extreme circumstances. So I want to give you some examples of that. Um, I'm currently working on a project um, in the Greater North, in this northern area in Liverpool, working with a group of men who have been diagnosed as having dangerous and severe personality disorder. They're not interested in the arts. They're not interested in arts practice. What they're interested in is staying out of prison. Okay? Now, this project currently is funded by a partnership between the police, the health service, um, the, the National Probation Service, such that it is, um, and, the, and the local authority. I guess one of my first questions within this broader debate here today is whether um, and how such partnerships will continue to grow and thrive in the future, and whether there'll be a space for small-scale arts organisations such as us to be able to work within them. We do our work first and foremost, because we're committed to the idea that everyone should have access to good art practice and they should be able to fully participate in culture as both a consumer and a maker, hence the participatory aspect of our work. We do it as well because we understand that the challenge of undertaking the work provokes our artists and the people who work with us to come up with some really interesting and extraordinary and innovative work. It's a great training ground. And thirdly, we do it because we want to change the world, right? I have no problem with making that as a statement. I want to make the world a better place, which I think echoes some of the things that have been said earlier on about social change. Well, I, well, I, well, I hope it does. Another quick project that I'd like to pick up on, and one that I'm particularly proud to have set up and be associated with, is a project which is currently goes by the name of the Manchester Men's Room, but, but started off as a project within TIP, a project called the Blue Room, which was working specifically with men in the city centre who were selling sex to men. It was a hidden community that was not being engaged by any existing services. That had, that had come to um, our attention through the wonderful work of a couple of our project managers. And, and we created a project specifically for those men. That is something that the small scale, I believe, is particularly good at doing, responding very, very quickly to identified need and putting projects in place which can then experiment and innovate. We did it by buying a tent um, and putting that tent up in the middle of the red light district. We put a colour gas heater in it as well because we were worried about the artist's hands getting cold. But that's how we started that project of participation through to engagement. That project was so successful that we made it into a separate charitable arts organisation, the Manchester Men's Room. Again, another small-scale organisation working with men in their particular... Uh, for, 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 with, in their particular case, who exist at the margins, who otherwise do not get a voice. These are men who, on the whole, and I know Jenny's going to reference this briefly in her presentation, who on the whole um, um, are dismissed and ignored by, the, by virtually every other agency they work with, social agency, um, statutory agency that they work with, because they are so difficult and challenging to work with. So we fulfill a particular role within the social ecology as well, um, I would argue. Um, one of the comments I would, one thing I want, I want to just move to a conclusion around is just recognizing that people have asked me a couple of times this afternoon, people who I know very well have asked me a couple of times, how are we getting on at the minute? And my answer, and it's honestly the truth, is that we have an awful lot of work on. However, the infrastructure to support that work is slowly but surely disappearing. Youth services are disappearing. Youth offending services are being carved away to, to next to nothing in, 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 some, in some areas. I have to say, however, I have to acknowledge with, the, with youth offending services being reduced, it is, it is because there's been a massive reduction in youth crime. So I find myself in a sort of slightly paradoxical position when I'm... Um, I'm a bit concerned about the fact that we've been successful in our work. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> our success is indeed characterised by people moving on from us and not coming back. Um, so my question is this, um, and it picks up on previous points. Um, it is a question about um, 
making an observation, a plea rather than a question, um, that, that we remain focused in this broader debate on the impact that the small-scale specialist arts organisations can have in the broader, again, phrase that was used earlier on, ecology of the arts within this greater northern region. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, and particularly for telling us about your thighs when you were younger. Um, uh, before we start the next uh, presentation, which will be from Jenny Hughes uh, on her work with, on poor theatres, and many of you may have already worked with Jenny or know her already. If you don't, you should. Um, can I just ask Francesca and Beatrice perhaps to get ready for the next panel and, and join Claire at the back um, so that we can move seamlessly on to the, to the second panel, Jenny? Over to you, please. Thank you. Okay. Nice to see everyone. Um, my name is Jenny Hughes. I teach and research drama at the University of Manchester. And for the last year and a half, I've been working on a theatre project called uh, Poor Theatres, which investigates the relationships between theatre poverty and economic justice. Economic justice is a phrase that I'm really want to introduce to this discussion uh, this afternoon. Um, it had a historical and a contemporary thread, and I'm going to focus on the contemporary thread really today. Uh, the historical thread worked from the starting point of the new poor law in 1834, exploring theatre's relationships to the new architectures of poverty that emerged through the 19th century city especially. Um, but the contemporary thread, which most of what I'm going to say today uh, relates to, uh, work with theatre projects in sites of economic deprivation and address uh, theatre projects that addressed uh, issues of economic justice. We documented five projects across Great Greater Manchester and also carried out online conversations with 15 artists engaging in economic justice projects across the world. Uh, this led to a free online resource which you can have a look at uh, by clicking on some of those links. I might move it over to the next one. Actually. Uh, you can search it via a map or a database. Um, a free online, online resource with around 250 items of data, of material, um, interviews, uh, walking tours, recordings of performances, scripts, images, all kinds of material relating to those projects. What we wanted to do was create a research platform whereby some of the know-how, the, the creativity, and the intelligence in the everyday life of a theatre project, its commons, and I'm going to return to the term commons in a, in a while, can be shared. The contemporary part of the research drew inspiration fr from Frederick Engels' tour of Victorian Man Manchester in the condition of the working class in England, originally published in 1845. Engels, Engels was one of the first to point out how the spatial logics of capitalism were mar marked by and worked to conceal stark inequalities. In his account of abject poverty in the great towns of Manchester, uh, Engels takes readers from Rochdale in the north, I don't know where the north is from here, um, uh, to Bolton, to Ashton under Lyne, and into the centres of Manchester and Salford, drawing attention to the plight of the poor in the, uh, the height of the Industrial Revolu Revolution. We, d we documented five local projects or regional projects working at points on Engels' map of Manchester and its great, t great towns. Um, and the idea here was to explore how theatre projects are navigating a culture of austerity as well as long-term inequalities that shape people's lives in uh, many of our neighbourhoods. So just briefly, the projects were the agency from Contact Theatre, working in partnership with Battersea Arts Centre in London. Uh, the agency is an, an innovation of a Brazilian theatre director, Marcus Faustini, used, which uses method of, methods of devised theatre uh, as a training tool to develop entrepreneurial ventures, small businesses led by young people from economically deprived areas in the favelas initially and then via contact working from the Miners Centre, brilliant centre in Moston, uh, with young people from Moston and Harper Hay. Secondly, Oct Octagon Theatre's partnership with um, Bolton at Home, um, which is one of the most inspiring art arts initiatives that I've come across uh, in my time researching um, theatre in, in this region, really. Uh, the Octagon 
these are all inspiring. I've created a hierarchy, um, which I don't mean to. Uh, um, the Octagon, a major regional theatre, has an ongoing partnership with Bolton at Home. Um, the partnership means that every Bolton, and Bolton at Home run uh, 18,000 homes across Bolton. They're a social housing charity. Um, as they call themselves now. Uh, the partnership means that every Bolton at Home tenant is a member of the theatre and it also supports free ticket scheme, free ticket scheme and theatre clubs in neighbourhoods. The third project, the Edge Arts Centre, uh, partnership with the Booth Centre in uh, uh, advice and support agency for people with experiences of homelessness in the city centre. There's a, they have a theatre company run by, uh, led by performers who have experienced homelessness. Um, uh, Men's Room Manchester, which I'm not going to talk about, as Simon, Simon has, uh, I'm not going to talk about in much detail, an arts and social care agency which works with some of the most vulnerable young men in the city centre, uh, delivering an art, regular arts provision underpinned by a social care ethos, a really progressive social care ethos. Finally, the Royal Exchange Theatres, in fact, I've got a Men's Room picture. Where do I point this? Oh, I've broken it. Ah, there you go. That's Haley Speed from the men's room. Um, finally, the Royal Exchange Theatre's three-year partnership with New Charter Housing, a social housing charity in Ashton under Lyne, which included a range of theatre projects linking a school and a neighbourhood, culminating in an outdoor community performance produced as a partnership with Choll Theatre in Huddersfield. You can get a sense of, of the ecology again here. Um, the performance ended with a spectacle of fire letters spelling out the phrase, this is ours. I'm just going to point it randomly. There you go. Uh, this is ours in front of um, a crowd of people from the local neighbourhood. That gives a very brief overview of the region-specific aspects of the poor theatre's research. I've been, I've been asked to explore a key challenge uh, arising from this research for the devolution agenda uh, and to think about how it might be addressed by the arts and cultural sector. So the key challenge for me is how can we ensure that a drive for economic justice is at the heart of this discussion? The initiatives that I've been describing here address in, uh, economic inequalities in various ways, but many are struggling to survive a culture of austerity where cult cuts to public subsidy, and I was saddened to hear of the end of public subsidy from uh, Darren Henley earlier today, cuts to public subsidy are threatening cultural practices that cannot hope to ever be market efficient. On the one hand, the Devo agenda turns to the riches and permanence of place as a means of defense against economic uncertainties, as a means of economic growth. On the other hand, it's embedded in a neoliberal economic agenda that threatens to de decimate local cultural practices by turning place into an income-generating venture, which in turn risks reinforcing profound inequalities and hierarchies. Thank you. <laughs> Been dying to say that. <laughs> uh, this is a context where socially engaged art projects and any productive unit, in fact, from individuals to all kinds of agencies, are asked to evidence social and economic effectiveness to show the economic and or social return on investment. I think we have to be really careful of these phrases. And as part of this, to work harder, do more with less, to be realistic. Um, the rules of the economic game ask us to treat ourselves as if we were not democratic citizens committed to economic justice, political rights, collective action, but rather to cite political philosopher Wendy Brown, to treat ourselves as, as inf investment portfolios, economically efficient, productive, worthy of speculation. So how might it be addressed? Oh, great. I said three minutes at this point. Three minutes left. Um, working alongside artists uh, in context of austerity, I've been drawn to the idea of the commons to understand the resource systems which support and sustain these practices. And I'm just going to talk really briefly about the common, commons. The commons indicates a, a practice of resource that is extra economic. It's linked to the economic, but it's about all these things that make an economic system uh, function. To return to the Royal Exchange Partnership in Ashton under Line, um, when this worked well, and it didn't always work well, but when it worked well, artists practiced responsively and in concert with an existing commons in the neighborhood it was working in. The, creati the creativity that exists and that has been sustained for many years before, during, and after the time of the funded project. By commons, I mean those things that belong equally to more than one. 
I'm quoting Peter Lambert there, common sense historian. The resources attaching, attaching to a place or population organized in ways that hold those resources open for use by all. Commoning refers to the practices that use, replenish, and protect such commons. What might a cultural commons of the North look like? Commons, the extra economic things that sustain any economic relation, can be lots of things. The missions of arts organisations, embedded in the memory of that arts organisation's relationships, buildings, archives, the energy of a project or a place. Commons can be informal relationships, formal partnerships, clubs, hubs, institutions, committed to an ethos of sharing, of being open to the common. Commons are also feelings, atmospheres, ideas, images, perceptions, knowledge, again, shared and held in common, available to all. Writing about the proliferation of commoning in Detroit in the US, Adrian Parr shows how commons projects in sites of extraordinary economic precarity develop in ways that are slow, partial, unstable, messy, ad hoc, experimental, improvised, and hybrid. Good examples of commons initiatives tends, tend to stress voluntary participation in a commons born of recognition of the mutual benefits of commoning. In terms of the arts, visitors, audiences, service users, artists, administrators are all reframed as commons contributors. Commons cultural initiatives are embedded in post-crisis and fairer systems of economic governance, which promote diverse models of ownership, production and consumption, cooperative working practices, generative rather than extractive use of resource, open access, freely available space, social forms of entrepreneurship, all represented to different degrees in the case studies of the Poor Theatre's research, all perfectly possible for us to bring, bring about, should we want to. Thank you. Thank you.